Hello and welcome to the 8th class of our online ECG course. Today we'll be discussing a crucial topic in both clinical electrocardiography and clinical medicine, myocardial infarction and ischemia, ST segment elevation, and Q-wave syndromes. As medical professionals, it's essential to have a solid understanding of this subject, as it's a key aspect of diagnosing ischemic heart disease and informing treatment decisions. Let's get started by diving into myocardial ischemia and its role in myocardial infarction. Let's begin with myocardial ischemia. In simple terms, ischemia refers to a reduced blood flow to the heart muscle, which leads to a lack of oxygen and other essential nutrients. This can happen if a coronary artery becomes severely narrowed or completely blocked. When ischemia is transient, it may lead to angina pectoris during exercise. However, if the ischemia is more severe, it can result in necrosis or the death of a portion of the heart muscle, which is referred to as myocardial infarction or, more commonly, a heart attack. Now let's discuss the two types of ischemia, transmural and subendocardial. To understand these better, let's look at a simplified cross-sectional diagram of the left ventricle. You'll notice that the left ventricle has an outer layer, called the epicardium or subepicardium, and an inner layer, called the subendocardium. This distinction is important because ischemia can either be limited to just the inner layer or it can affect nearly the entire thickness of the ventricular wall. Transmural ischemia involves the entire thickness of the wall, whereas subendocardial ischemia is limited to the inner layer of the heart muscle. To further our understanding of myocardial ischemia and infarction, we need to take a closer look at the myocardial blood supply. The heart receives oxygenated blood from the coronary arteries and their branches. There are three main coronary arteries. The right coronary artery, the left anterior descending coronary artery, and the left circumflex coronary artery. The right coronary artery is responsible for supplying blood to the inferior or diaphragmatic portion of the heart, as well as the right ventricle. The left main coronary artery divides into the left anterior descending coronary artery, which typically supplies the ventricular septum and a significant part of the left ventricular free wall, and the left circumflex coronary artery, which supplies the lateral wall of the left ventricle. It's important to note that this circulation pattern can be variable. For example, sometimes the circumflex artery also supplies the infrabasterior portion of the left ventricle. Myocardial infarctions tend to be localized to the region of the left ventricle that's supplied by one of these arteries or their branches. In the next scene, we'll discuss how these infarctions affect the ECG and its different phases. Transmural myocardial infarction is characterized by ischemia and ultimately necrosis of a portion of the entire, or nearly the entire, thickness of the left ventricular wall. Patients who present with acute myocardial infarction typically have underlying atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. The pathophysiology of acute ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, or STEMI, and the subsequent evolving Q-wave myocardial infarction most often relates to the occlusion of one of the coronary arteries due to a ruptured atherosclerotic plaque, followed by the formation of a clot at this site. The clot in the so-called culprit artery is composed of platelets and fibrin, blocking blood flow downstream. Other factors, such as cocaine use, coronary artery dissections, coronary emboli, and other factors, can also cause or contribute to acute STEMI. Large transmural myocardial infarctions generally produce changes in both myocardial depolarization, seen in the QRS complex, and myocardial repolarization, seen in the STT complex. The earliest ECG changes observed with acute transmural ischemia or infarction typically occur in the STT complex in sequential phases. In the next scene, we'll delve into these sequential phases and their ECG manifestations. Now that we understand the basics of ST segment elevation, transmural ischemia, and acute myocardial infarction, let's explore the sequential phases of ECG changes that occur in STEMI. There are two main phases. The acute phase is characterized by the appearance of ST segment elevations and sometimes tall positive or hyperacute T waves in multiple leads, typically two or more. This phase is referred to as STEMI. The evolving phase takes place hours or days later and is marked by deep T wave inversions in the leads that previously exhibited ST elevations. Transmural myocardial infarctions can also be described in terms of the location of the infarct. Anterior refers to the involvement of the anterior or lateral wall of the left ventricle. 
whereas inferior indicates the involvement of the inferior or diaphragmatic wall of the left ventricle. The anatomic location of the infarct determines the leads in which typical ECG patterns appear. For example, with an acute anterior wall myocardial infarction, the stus segment elevations and tall hyperacute T waves appear in one or more of the anterior leads, which are chest leads V1 to V6 and extremity leads D1 and AVL. Conversely, with an inferior wall myocardial infarction, the stus segment elevations and tall hyperacute T waves are seen in the inferior leads D2, D3, and AVF. As we continue to analyze ECG changes in STEMI, it's crucial to understand the concept of reciprocal changes. These changes can provide valuable insights into the diagnosis of myocardial infarctions. Reciprocal changes refer to the fact that the anterior and inferior leads often display inverse patterns. In the case of an anterior infarction with ST segment elevations in two or more of the leads V1 to V6, D1 and AVL, ST segment depression is frequently observed in leads D2, D3 and AVF. On the other hand, with an acute inferior wall infarction, leads D2, D3 and AVF exhibit stus segment elevation, while reciprocal ST depressions are often seen in one or more of the leads V1 to V3, D1 and AVL. The ST segment elevation associated with acute myocardial infarction is known as the current of injury, which indicates that damage has occurred to the epicardial or outer layer of the heart due to severe ischemia. The exact reasons that acute myocardial infarction produces ST segment elevation are complex and not fully understood. Normally, the ST segment is isoelectric, meaning that no net current flow is occurring at this time. Myocardial infarction alters the electrical charge on the myocardial cell membranes in several ways, resulting in abnormal current flow or current of injury, which then produces ST segment deviations. Now let's discuss the various shapes and appearances of ST segment elevation seen in acute myocardial infarction. The ST segment may be plateau shaped, dome shaped, or obliquely elevated. These different forms of ST segment elevation are important to recognize in order to accurately diagnose acute myocardial infarction. The ST segment elevations and reciprocal ST depressions are the earliest ECG signs of infarction and are generally seen within minutes of blood flow occlusion. Tall, positive or hyperacute T waves may also be present at this time. In some cases, hyperacute T waves can perceive the ST elevations. Strict criteria for determining whether ST segment and J-point elevations are due to acute ischemia are limited because of false positives and false negatives. However, it is crucial for clinicians to be aware that ST changes in acute ischemia may evolve with the patient under observation. If the initial ECG is not diagnostic of STEMI, but the patient continues to have symptoms consistent with myocardial ischemia, serial ECGs at 5 to 10 minute intervals or continuous 12 lead ST segment monitoring should be performed. As we've discussed earlier, the evolving phase of infarction is characterized by deep T wave inversions in the leads that previously displayed ST segment elevations. This phase usually occurs hours or even a few days after the acute phase. During the evolving phase, the elevated ST segments start to return to the baseline. And simultaneously, the T waves become inverted in leads that showed ST segment elevations before. With an anterior wall infarction, the T waves become inverted in one or more of the anterior leads, such as V1 to V6, D1 and AVL. In the case of an inferior wall infarction, the T waves become inverted in one or more of the inferior leads, like D2, D3 and AVF. Recognizing these evolving T wave inversions is vital to understanding the progression of myocardial infarction and making accurate diagnoses. These changes provide crucial information about the stage of the infarction and can guide clinical decision-making and patient management. Myocardial infarction, especially when large and transmural, often produces distinct changes in the QRS complex. The most characteristic of these changes is the appearance of new Q waves. In case you're wondering why certain myocardial infarctions lead to Q waves, let's refresh our memory about what a Q wave is. It is simply an initial negative deflection of the QRS complex. If the entire QRS complex is negative, it is referred to as a QS complex. Now, what happens during a transmural infarction? Necrosis of heart muscle occurs in a localized area of the ventricle. As a result, the electrical voltages produced by this portion of the myocardium disappear. 
Instead of positive R waves over the infarcted area, Q waves are often recorded, either as a QR or QS complex. However, it's important to understand that not all transmural infarcts lead to Q waves, and not all Q wave infarcts correlate with transmural necrosis. Thus, abnormal Q waves serve as characteristic markers of infarction, signifying the loss of positive electrical voltages caused by the death of heart muscle. The new Q waves of a myocardial infarction generally appear within the first day or so of the infarct. Their appearance in different leads can help us determine the location of the infarction. We have anterior wall Q wave infarctions, inferior wall infarctions, posterior infarctions, and right ventricular infarctions. Recognizing these patterns can help us understand the severity and extent of the infarction and guide us in the treatment. It is crucial to differentiate between normal and abnormal Q waves, since not all Q waves are indicators of me. Normal septal Q waves are characteristically narrow and of low amplitude, while abnormal Q waves may occur in leads such as lead AVL, leads D3, and AVF. In conclusion, Q waves of infarction can help us better understand the extent and nature of myocardial infarctions. Their significance in clinical practice cannot be overstated. By studying these waves and their characteristics, we can develop effective strategies to diagnose and manage our patients with myocardial infarction. We appreciate your time spent learning with us today. If you found this course beneficial, we kindly ask for your support. Share this video with colleagues, subscribe to our channel, and leave us a positive rating. Furthermore, if possible, consider donating any amount via the link in the video description below. Your support empowers us to keep offering free top-notch education to all who seek it. Before concluding, we're excited to announce our upcoming class on myocardial infarction and ischemia, which will focus on non stust segment elevation and non-Q wave syndromes. This vital topic is essential for mastering ECG interpretation, and we can't wait to explore it further with you. To stay informed on our newest lessons, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell. Thank you for being a part of our educational journey today and we look forward to welcoming you to our next 100% online and complimentary ECG course.